Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We have a great conversation planned for tonight. I read a couple articles on this and thought it was a good topic to talk about. It kind of continues our conversation from a few weeks ago when we were talking about threat and vulnerability management. We briefly talked about it at the end where we were talking about how do you get a list of different assets? And I read a blog from Daniel Wiesner. I think that's how you say his name. And uh, another article uh, in Dark Reading that talked about asset management. And basically what they were saying is if you're not doing continuous asset management, you're not doing security. And security teams are basically ignoring one of the things that can help shore up your security at your com- at your company if by if you're not doing this activity, right? So if you were to ask yourself what is in your technology stack, are you able to answer that question? Do you have someone dedicated full time to asset management? I think that is a really thought provoking question because if you ask a company to hire somebody as a full-time asset management person and to keep a list updated, they'll ask, they'll basically look at you like you're crazy. You're out of your mind. They may say that we don't have budget to spend on something silly like that. Like have a person just keep a list of the things that we have. I mean, if you think about the other things that you spend money on, like snacks for the break room or multiple security tools that you probably haven't deployed yet or marketing campaigns that have no ties to your sales results. This is actually something that can directly impact your security and you're afraid to spend money on it. So I think this is something that we often shy away from And as we were talking about it in the pre-show, Adam, you had mentioned that a lot of times asset management morphs into like tagging the assets, like the physical assets and creating lists of your laptops and then getting involved in the procurement process. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about finding out what servers you have on your network and who, what applications are on it and who's in charge of those applications and what are the firewalls that you have and what are the SaaS apps that you have, you know, um, endpoints are part of it as well for sure. But you also need to look at data, you know, the applications have access to data. And so what data are you trying to protect? And if you don't have a comprehensive list of servers, applications, and where that data is housed, you're not going to know how to protect it is basically the point. Yeah, I think the phrase I used to describe this was digital asset management as opposed to kind of physical asset management because we're trying to keep track of our digital assets, both software and software development and tools and servers and things that cross that digital divide between physical as well as, um, you know, ones and zeros essentially. And so I think that's really important because I'll be honest, I have a a relatively dim view of, of IT asset management. Um, While I recognize that it's a required function at very, very mature organizations, I think a lot of times it's, there's not a lot of value add there. And I think as we'll discuss tonight, there is so much value add from digital asset management when it comes to your cybersecurity posture, because this at least lets you know what you're protecting, what you're trying to defend and giving you that visibility across 
everything that you are responsible for. If you think of a teacher, you know, gets a class list of here are the 25 kids you're responsible for. Can, can you imagine if a teacher like went in the classroom and then a bunch of kids just showed up and said, here, you know, take care of them. You're like, well, I don't, I don't, are, are these all mine? You know, are they all here today? Is somebody absent? Is somebody sick? Like you don't even know and have your arms around what the full scope of your work is. And so that's kind of the thesis of these two articles um, on dark reading by the uh, one, of, one of the leaders over at Arctic Wolf is who wrote the dark reading article. And then Daniel Measler's article, which is actually from a couple of years ago, but updated recently in response to, well, really Log4j, I think is what has brought this conversation back to the forefront, which really dovetails nicely into our next point, Andy. Yeah. Log4j, again, still in the news, but I think it revealed a secret that cybersecurity defenders have known for years. If your CEO or CISO were to ask you, you know, oh, I'm hearing about this Log4j vulnerability, what's our exposure? And if you can't answer that question because you don't know what you have, then you're in trouble, right? You're probably at risk. So if you don't have an accurate catalog, you're just not able to answer that simple question of what's my exposure and what is the risk right now? And that's what leaders need to know. So I think Log4j is a perfect example and illustration of the significance of having a complete view to make sure that you are applying patches everywhere they need to go and quickly. The problem is, is that once the dust settles on Log4j, security teams will basically go back to their long list of other things. I've been there, and so I know that your day-to-day is just inundated with, you know, incident response, tickets, deploying other tools, people asking you to do software review. You know, it goes on and on and on. And so you're not going to have time to do this fundamental but extremely not exciting need for asset management, asset and application management, right? So digital asset management. So you may consider it a success that you avoided something breaching your network or avoided an attack in this particular case, but you're not really looking to the future to be better prepared next time for when your CISO or CEO asks you again, oh, I'm hearing about this vulnerability. What's our exposure? So it's a vicious cycle, but we should try to break that and have this conversation about asset management and get better at it. And that takes actual effort and work. If you think of what Andy is saying, your first instinct might be, well, I don't want to look silly in front of CEO, CISO, CIO, whomever. So I want to be sure to have a tight answer to that question on what's our exposure. Sure. Yeah. You want to look good for the boss. I get that, but go deeper than that. If your answer to that is, I don't know, but I'll find out. That's, that's an okay answer. In a lot of cases, you know, leaders respect people who have that, that mindset of, I will run that down for you more than somebody who knows everything off the top of their head. But now that time, those cycles that you're spending, running down like, hey, how much Log4j do we have? Where is it? Uh, Is time that you are not implementing those protective or mitigative controls and now you have exposure, you know, to that. Well, you're determining if you have exposure. It's kind of that, like you use the phrase, Andy, vicious cycle of trying to run something down and, and get that visibility in the fog of war when if you already clearly knew what you had and what you're working with, you can immediately begin to implement those protective measures. And so that's like a really, really obvious example of how this, this asset management, digital asset management, I'm going to keep saying digital there um, can, can help defenders improve their responsiveness and their protectiveness of the organization. And I think your other point too, that most security folks, especially in security engineering, security operations, 
they're they're running from one fire to the other. You know, everything's high priority all the time. And it, at a really, really mature organization with a really healthy security staff, they might have more time for focused work, but the amount of time and the amount of focused work this is truly going to take, again, I think the thesis of our conversation tonight, Andy, and, and you and I are in agreement on this, this is a worthwhile investment in an FTE. And when you get right down to it, yes, I understand an FTE costs a lot more than just their salary. There are significant additional costs with their benefits and acquisition and everything else. Understood. Even with that and with market rates these days, acquiring an FTE costs you a heck of a lot less than acquiring a new tool that you can't deploy. So uh, certainly it's something where spinning up a new practice in your organization and hey, you know what? It might even be better to have it under the cybersecurity group, as opposed to in like your traditional, like I said, the stodgy asset management part of the company, because they get hung up on kind of the wrong things. This is, this is something that needs to move fast and move frequently and stay up to date, because if it's not up to date, you know, the value just diminishes really, really quickly as we get into, oh, that hasn't been updated in one month, two months, three months. You know how that feels when you're ever working on something and you discover something that's several months old, your attitude is basically like, well, this is worthless. I'm not even going to look at that. I'm going to have to go do that all, all over again. Technology just moves too fast. If stuff isn't up to date and we can't trust it, we won't trust it to be comprehensive. And then we'll go do the work anyways, you know, and that is another waste of time as well. So, you know, Log4j definitely brought a lot of this conversation back to the forefront and, uh, it's a good time to have this conversation right now while it's still top of mind. Yeah. Digital asset management, as we have kind of talked about here is not just servers applications is a huge, huge part of it. So I tried to do a little bit of this at my previous position at my previous organization, but again, it's very difficult to do if you're also in charge of doing other things, security at that company. This really, as Adam said, requires an FTE, maybe two, maybe three, depending on how large your organization is. For example, at my previous organization, we used Box, the cloud storage SaaS application. That's where a lot of data was, but you know, you had to know who the Box administrators were, who was in charge of that, and then go to another app, you know, AWS who's in charge of those applications and who's in charge of those servers and on and on it goes. And there's multiple different applications with multiple different administrators. And one of the things that I tried to do was give a task to one of our IAM folks to catalog this, just have a list of here's an app. And if someone needs administrative access to this application, you know, this is who they contact because security often owns the visibility into different systems, but they may not be the administrators of different systems. And that's kind of where the quandary is for security folks is if you're asking me for access to a system that I don't own, I couldn't tell you that you're supposed to have access to that. Right? So I need to contact the application or the system owner to say, Hey, Adam is requesting access to this is this the appropriate amount of rights? Because sometimes I have no idea what rights are supposed to be granted. And so having a comprehensive list of those applications, those system owners and who to go to is also really important and a basic fundamental part of identity and access management. So if you have someone who's an IAM person, you know, maybe they could float over to asset management as well. Another thing is, you know, just as a, an anecdotal um, example, you may be asking yourself, I have no idea how I can find out what assets we own. So if it's on your network, we talked about a threat and vulnerability management scanner. Doing those scans based on subnets or um, on your network you can do a discovery scan and find different systems. 
we talked about how a lot of times you'll be surprised all of a sudden you're, you're scanning and you see, you know, you have five 2008 servers and you're like, well, that's not supported anymore. That's a way to find out what's on your network. There's also tools out there called NDRs, network detection and response. There's a lot of companies like dark trace or Vectra or extra hop. Those are all different con- companies that have, physical and virtual appliances that you can put on a spam port and then figure out all the different devices that are on your network. When it comes to software, you can use a CASB and do discovery for different cloud apps. And again, you'll be surprised at what people are accessing on their machines if they're all of a sudden using a bunch of different SaaS apps and uploading and downloading different amounts of data, you can ask the question, like, if you're not aware that we're using Box and all of a sudden you see a bunch of users and data being uploaded to Box, you can ask the question of, hey, I didn't know that people were using Box. Why, why, do, why is that on our network? Why are we uploading all this information to it? So Shadow IT Discovery is a great function for CASB to discover different SaaS apps that you might have on your network and then using some sort of network device, network detection and response, an NDR appliance or a threat and vulnerability scanner. Those are all different ways that you can build visibility into what is on your network. You're seeing more and more tools come up with these capabilities as well, kind of recognizing how challenging it's been to wrap your arms around it and adding capabilities and features that can help discover those kind of unknown data points or uh, maybe not broadly shared bits of information too. So I I think those are good call outs and some of the different tools available, but um, you know, that's, that's one way of collecting that information. Another way is again, kind of going out and having those conversations around, uh, what do you got going on? You know, what, what, what do you have? What, what assets do you have in your day-to-day work? Because Andy, I think you were also talking about before we went on the air, the idea of somebody spinning up servers in AWS or GCP or Azure. And that's a whole other can of worms to discover all of that. And uh, a whole other skill set to navigate those systems and, uh, and be able to get visibility in all of it. It wouldn't be terribly difficult to give this theoretical digital asset management person, you know, kind of like reader permission to your whole Azure infrastructure so they can go out and catalog, you know, what are all your uh, VPNs and your, your VNets and your different VMs and wrap their arms around who owns what and what's going on. But that's, that's a big skill set too. You know, speaking of like dedicating an FTE to this, just think about that on top of traditional on-premises on network things you can scan and detect with TVM solutions or NDR solutions or whatever. Now you got a whole other ball game to go look at too. So there's just there's so much out there. It's just explosive. You know, I um, used to be a technical specialist that covered information protection and I forget what the exact numbers were, but it talked about the explosion of data being created. And this is more focused on like, unstructured data, you know, documents, files, that sort of thing. But there were numbers that were cited and it was to encourage organizations to get started right away because the problem's only going to get worse. And it was something like, you know, all of the data created since, you know, the dawn of technology, you know, in the sixties and seventies is blah amount of exabytes or whatever, you know, I might not be using the right uh, prefix there, but you get the idea we are going to generate that much data in the next three years or five years or something like that. So you think of in the last 50 years of technology, we've created this much data. And then in the next five, you know, a 10 X increase, we're going to create that much again. And, and the point was, if you don't start protecting your data now, you're going to have a really hard time because it's only going to get bigger and more unwieldy and harder to do. So the best thing to do is start today and I make that point and that analogy to kind of compare it to this when we, we just talk about the, the breadth 
of things you need to cover and catalog and have your arms wrapped around this problem every day that goes by is only going to get harder and harder to manage because same thing um digital estates are only growing in size they're not shrinking as every company becomes a digital company you know they're spinning up more servers more applications generating more data using more vendors you know um and so this is just a uh kind of a call to action here uh, of the seriousness and importance of this because sticking your head in the sand the problem's only going to get worse when you pull it out Another thing that can compound the problem of asset management is acquisitions and mergers. I think if you're a company that is looking at acquisitions and mergers, you should get security involved right away in the beginning of the discussion and not at the end. Because when you do an acquisition or a merger, you're going to bring on new assets. And if you don't, have an idea of what those assets are, then you're going to be in trouble. One of the things that I learned from experience at my previous org was when solar winds happened. Nobody really knew that we had solar winds because it was part of an acquisition. So when it happened, I kind of just asked the question because I had been in discussions with our network team and they were, they were saying, Oh, Hey, you know, the other guys over there have solar winds that they use as like an IPAM solution, IP asset management. And I was like, Oh, well that's, that's kind of cool. Um, but then solar winds happen. And I asked the question said, Hey, I think we have solar winds. What's our exposure. And it just so happens that the person who was in charge of it, the one person who knew the system the best was on paternity leave. And so we were scrambling around for a little bit, but had I not asked the question, you know, who would have known what the damage was going to be like, because no one was maintaining it at the time. No one was really doing any of the patching and no one asked the question when the news came up that day. So that's just more of another point of if you're at a company that is doing mergers and acquisitions, maybe it's better to keep your assets separate until you have a good idea of what the other company has before bringing on who knows what right into your network. So in the blog, Daniel was saying the measure of a security team should be what they say when you ask them five different questions, what's currently facing the internet? How many total systems do you have? Where's your data? How many vendors do you have? And which vendors have what kind of your data? And if you can't answer those questions, then that's something that is really troubling in my mind. Because if you can't answer what you have, then it's really hard to protect it. So, again, I think Daniel said it in his blog, and and Adam and I agree on this. One of the single best things that a company can do is to hire a dedicated person to maintain a near real-time list of your company assets. And you can use a single metric to measure yourself. You know, he has this little grading system in his blog for if you have a list that is 90% accurate or less than a week old, then you get an A. You know, 80% one month old, it's a B. And, you know, that's something that you can put into every security leader's deck. And the goal is to get to 95% accuracy with a daily to weekly update every, you know, within six months. And so... If you're listening to this episode and you're asking yourself, you know, what do I have? Do I even have a list that is, you know, more than 60% comprehensive or has been updated, you know, within the last 30 days? And if the answer is no, then again, this is kind of a call to action because this is a conversation that all security teams should be having. It is a fundamental 
part of security, just like patching. It's something that we often shy away from. We don't talk about, and quite honestly, we don't do a very good job of, but I think it is one of those basic things, right? It's not a flashy tool. It takes real work, real effort, but it definitely will pay dividends if you know what you have. I love the grading scale here. And I think it touches on my point that really you get those diminishing returns in a hurry if it becomes too outdated. I mean, you still might look at it, but you're still going to do a lot of work around it because you're like, well, this is just too old to trust to be comprehensive. And I, I worked in IT for quite some time in my career before joining Microsoft. And absolutely this sort of thing did not exist. Even in companies um, that had relatively mature, like, ITAM, IT asset management shops, they weren't doing a lot of stuff like this. And and in general, again, I, I mentioned had a relatively dim view of that work. They did things that like got in the way. I, I mean, I'll just give you an example of like what's not value add. Um, I worked at this company where they very openly said, like one of our company benefits that we want you to have here is you can ship your packages here. You can get your UPS, your FedEx packages and ship them to the office because that way you're not worried about them getting lost or stolen off your doorstep. You're not going to stay home to go sign for things. We'll sign for it. We get it early in the morning because we're a business. You know, business gets the first delivery and then we'll bring it to your desk. And that's like a perk of working for this company. And that was freaking awesome, man. I got all my stuff delivered to the office all the time. Well, IT asset management decided that at some point, somebody had gone rogue, you know, like around them and had bought like some devices or something without letting them know. So they decided that they were going to open everyone's mail that got shipped to the office and inspect it to make sure there were no IT assets in it before delivering it to your desk. And I started asking the questions of who approved this, who knows about this, you know, we're in the leadership chain. Does this get approved? Like, don't do that. Right. That's not what we're talking about here. Just so we're, we're crystal clear on this. This is like, you are here to add value. You are not here to be the bad guy. You're not here to be the inspector. You're not here to create problems. You're here to create a tool that is a massive solution in helping secure the organization and has tremendous value. That is not value add. That is like taking your job way too seriously for very incremental benefit where you know, one or two employees had gone rogue and ordered stuff without going through the proper procurement process. Solve that with policy and with discipline and everything else, but don't go do stuff like that. So I just want to clarify like what we are and aren't talking about here and, and why I mentioned like uh, I, I personally have had negative experience with IT asset management in the past and why we're, we're talking about something different here. Um, but I, I, I think Andy brought this to me as a, a subject for the show tonight and as we kind of talked through it before we went on the air, really did see the value in, in what we're talking about here, especially for security defenders. And I think these two articles we're going to put in the show notes, uh, the one on dark reading from the Arctic Wolf um, leader, as well as the one from Daniel Meisler, like they're worth your time to just give a quick skim and, and understand what they're talking about here. And I get it. You know, there's plenty of companies that aren't doing great and aren't really super interested in hiring or... You can't find somebody to hire. So maybe there are ways you can carve out some of your time as a group or as a team and, and at least get started on an exercise like this too. Like, I certainly don't want the takeaway from the show to be like, I'm not a leader, so I don't get to make those decisions. Or I am a leader and I can't hire for reasons X, Y, and Z. And so your attitude is, well, we can't do anything, right? Ideally, yes, this should be somebody with a, a full-time dedication to this process because it's going to be hard to get it comprehensive, but even non-comprehensive is still valuable. If somebody can produce a document that's like, hey, here's everything um, the network team knows about. Here's everything the infrastructure team knows about. Like, That's not going to cover some of those servers hiding in a corner that have been drywalled over and have been running Windows 2000 for 20 years straight without crashing, um, but it's going to cover a lot. So Hopefully a takeaway from the show is ideally to really spin up a practice here that can add tremendous value and protective capabilities to your org. But if that's off the table, there are ways that 
any security defender can work with some of the other stakeholders at their company and start to at least bring some maturity to this process and start to build some cataloging and some pulling information together. And honestly, the next time something comes around, which, you know, is a when, not if, you'll be the hero when you helped your company be more ready to answer those questions of what is our exposure? What is facing the internet? How many systems do we have running this? You might not be able to say everything, but you're like, we know it's in the ballpark of X and Y. That's a huge step forward compared to where a lot of orgs were, which is like, do we have Log4J? I don't know. We'll go talk to app dev and find out, you know, kind of thing. So. I mean, even when we're buying security tools, right? Like vendors will ask you how many endpoints do you have? How many servers do you have? Because it's licensed per server or something like that. And honestly, you should know exactly to, you know, that day, how many servers you have, and you should be able to go to a list somewhere and figure that out. But 99% of companies I'm willing to bet couldn't answer that specific question. How many servers do we have? So again, it's a good call out Adam that, you know, not every company is going to have the ability or the budget to do something like this. But if you get started on it and have something, then the next time it comes around when you get attacked and those questions are asked, you'll have a better answer. Maybe not the entire answer, but you'll have a better answer than not knowing it at all. And that's our conversation and show for tonight. Thanks as always for listening and watching. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or topics that you want us to talk about. Thanks. So we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the blue security podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed and subscribe. So you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at a jaw zero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.